Okay. Good evening. And, uh, let's see. I don't know if uh, Hendrick, you want to close the door from outside? We don't lose all of our uh, cold air. There's a slope, so you can feel that draft just creeping over this way. <laughs> I remembered to unlock the doors this morning, so I apologize for any of you who had a hard time getting in today. But I'm glad that you're, you're here as we're going to continue to, to look at, at God's Word and study it together. But before we do that, let's take this moment to pray. God, as we enter into your house again, we confess that our hunger for you is not always what it should be. So grow our desire tonight so that we would know you better and that we would find our joy and satisfaction in your glory. Father, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So Leroy sent a, uh, a song request because uh, he, found, he was surprised this morning to find out that his Uncle Tony had passed away and then found out that apparently he hasn't passed away yet. It doesn't mean that he's in great condition, but he said in, in honor of that, he wanted us to sing, Low in the grave Christ lay, so he can sing up from the grave he rose. So not that, uh, not that we're going to be singing the song necessarily in memory of Tony. That's not the, the point of it. But it may, reminded him of the song, and it is a good song for us to, to sing. So that's going to be Grace Psalter Hymnal 396. So 396. So when you find it, if you would please stand. Oh, and Rich had also mentioned to me this morning that if we want to sing What a Friend We Have in Jesus in the tune that, that we're more familiar with, the red Psalter hymnals, Lift Up Your Hearts has that one. So just a note for next time. Okay. Lo, in the grave Christ lay, Jesus my Savior, waiting the coming day. Jesus, my Lord. Up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph for his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, Hallelujah, Christ arose. Vainly they watch his bed, Jesus my Savior. Vainly they seal the dead, Jesus my Lord. Up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph for his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. Death cannot keep its prey, Jesus my Savior. He tore the bars away, Jesus my Lord. Up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph for his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. And then Henny, you had mentioned Amazing Grace after 462. 62. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was 
was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear. The hour I first believed, the Lord has promised good to me. His word, my hope, secures. He will. And portion be as long as life endures through many dangers, toils, and snares. I have already come. Tis grace hath brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me Been there ten thousand years, bright shining as the sun. We've no less days to sing God's praise than when. We'd first be gone. All right. You guys can be seated. So that, that song is a classic for a good reason. And I always love that, that last part that uh, you know, when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first be gone. It's just that, that idea that the, the joys of the Lord are unending for us. And so, I uh, enjoy how much of his glory he's shown to me already, and I can't wait to see what it's like to see our God face to face. So tonight, we are looking at Lord's Day 31, so if you're using the Grace Psalter hymnals, that is going to be page 898, forgot to update my notes again, 99, 899, thank you. Yep. So we're going to be thinking about the, the keys of the kingdom tonight. Uh, but before that study, let's, let's pray again. Father, we, we do thank you for your words. We thank you for a uh, tradition like ours that has taken them seriously, like many believers around the world have seriously studied your word. And much of your word gives us a very clear and obvious hope but as we think about things like discipline, a message that can be hard to, to give to our friends or hard to receive from our friends, we pray that we see that, that even in discipline is a joy and hope that brings us closer to the glories of your name and your face and your kingdom. So Father, let us enjoy your word this evening. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we'll start with the question and answers of the Heidelberg Catechism, and then we'll look to the truth that is in God's Word. But I will read for us the questions, and then we can give the answers together. So question 83. What are the keys of the kingdom? The preaching of the Holy Gospel and Christian discipline toward repentance. 
both preaching and discipline, open the kingdom of heaven to believers and close it to unbelievers. How does preaching the gospel open and close the kingdom of heaven? According to the command of Christ, the kingdom of heaven is opened by proclaiming and publicly declaring to all believers, each and every one, that as often as they accept the gospel promise in true faith, God, because of what Christ has done, truly forgives all their sins. The kingdom of heaven is closed, however, by proclaiming and publicly declaring to unbelievers and hypocrites that, as long as they do not repent, the anger of God and eternal condemnation rest on them. God's judgment, both in this life and in the life to come, is based on this gospel testimony. How is the kingdom of heaven closed and opened by Christian discipline? According to the command of Christ, those called Christians, oops, sorry, those who called Christians profess unchristian teachings or live unchristian lives, and after repeated and loving counsel, refuse to abandon their errors and wickedness, and after being reported to the church, that is, to its officers, fail to respond also to his mission. Such persons the officers exclude from the Christian fellowship by withholding the sacraments from them, and God himself excludes them from the kingdom of Christ. Such persons, when promising and demonstrating genuine reform, are received again as members of Christ and of his church. All right. So we got a, a couple of themes that we are looking at this evening. We're looking at preaching and discipline. And uh, it's uh, perhaps maybe there are two things that we don't enjoy hearing. Hopefully, hopefully not so. Hopefully... Hopefully we're able to find joy in both of those. But if you're going to be sharing this Lord's Day with a friend, what scripture would you go to? Because as every night we want our study to be rooted in scripture. This is just a historic tool that we use, but the real truth is in God's word. So, all right. I see uh, some hands back there. Cohen, did you have a verse? Yeah, John chapter 20, verses 22 through 23. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. So what do you guys think about that declaration right there? <laughs> if you, uh, if you talk, talking to, uh, talking to the, the disciples, talking to his, his leaders of the church, if you forgive anyone their sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Sounds per like a really powerful skill, right? So it's in the Bible, so we need to believe it's true, but what, what do you make of that? Yeah, it's... Yeah. Yeah. So, so there, the, yeah, you you hit on an, an element that I, I wasn't considering up front, but, but yeah, it, it, we, we say you know, forgive me as, as I forgive others. Is the idea that if we're not forgiving of others, then are we people who are really delighting in in the forgiveness that God gives us? And so, just that idea right there of, well, there's an option to to not forgive. Okay. Okay. How how is that possible? And then also, it seems like it's giving a power that should really be God's, that, you know, that, that there are some people who are able to say, you're forgiven and you're not forgiven. Like, don't we say, well, you know, 
let, let God be the, the judge. You know, my, for, for me to tell you what God's word says, he's the one who will judge between us. I, like, all right. So there, there's a couple of, of heavy concepts right there. Well, what do we make of those? Yeah, I think that is a, a very important distinction to, to be able to, to make. Mm-hmm. Yeah, of course. Yeah. But if you sin against God, then it's your life that you're doing to God. Yeah. Yeah, and so I think I believe you're you're rightly making that that distinction there of like when we're talking about, you know, forgive others as as God has for, forgiven us. Yes. And we're, I can warn you. What's that? I can warn you and tell you that you need to repent. Yeah. Yeah, so you're, you're saying that there, there are sins that we, we do to each other and there are sins that we do to God, acknowledging that every sin we do to each other is also a sin that we, we do to God, but, um, but when we're, we're called to, to forgive each other, you know, there, there is a different element to that than, than talking about our, our, you know, our, our repentance to God and, and our being considered forgiven by him. And, uh, and that's where, you know, the, the context is, as we see in, in these verses. We also see in uh, Matthew chapter 16, verse 19, it says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And so he's, he's talking to, to Peter, and he's calling him the, the rock. And on this rock, the church will be, will be built. And so he, you know, he's, he's talking about this this authority that is, is placed over the church, that as he's going to be one of these elders, that, that he is responsible for declaring the, the truth of, of God to, to the people. And, and so as, as someone who's going to be an elder of the, the church, that he is responsible to, to speak on God's behalf. And so this, this kind of you know, forgiveness, uh, if someone is forgiven or not forgiven, it's, it's, it's not a declaration of, of the relationship between you and I, like you're pointing at, Gary. It's the relationship between us and God. You know, it's the responsibility of someone like Peter who is given the keys of the kingdom, who is, made, who is the rock that the church is built upon, to, to say to those, you know, in, in the eyes of God, you, know, you are someone who is forgiven. I see repentance in you. I see that humility and that desire to, to lean upon Christ, or I don't see forgiveness in you because I don't see repentance in you. And uh, we, we see Peter putting this into to place with Simon the sorcerer who, who believes that Jesus Christ is Lord, and yet we don't see repentance in Simon the sorcerer. And he calls, calls him wicked, I don't know the, the exact language, it's, it's a bit hard that um, let's see, Acts chapter, we're just looking at that. So is it nine? Nope. And, uh, yeah, Acts chapter eight. So Peter answered, so this would be verse 20, may your money perish with you because you thought that you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord in hope that he may forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. So it does seem like Peter is putting this concept into action. It's like, I look at you, I do not see repentance. And if you do not repent, then you are not forgiven and, and saved. And so there is a responsibility that the, the leaders of, of the church uh, have over the, the people to, to say, you know, I, I see that the fruit of the Spirit in you or I don't see the fruit of the, the Spirit in you. And something else that's, that's also helpful to understand, uh, and this is where it's, it's nice to, to be able to, to know the original languages like Greek or Hebrew, but this is one of the things I remember in seminary as we were studying Matthew chapter 16, verse 19, where it says, Whatever you bind on heaven will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth 
will be loosed in heaven. And so there, there is a verb tense that we don't have a great form of in English. It's called the perfect tense. And the perfect tense is one that says, this is something that has happened in the past, but continues to have an effect to today. And so the idea of you know, binding and loosing, it's, it's a kind of a covenantal language that, that you are bound, you, you are a part of the covenant family, or you are loosed, you are set go, let go from the, the covenant family. So it's a, it's, it's a different way of saying forgiven or unforgiven in the eyes of God. Are you a true believer or, or an unbeliever? But when we're looking at that language, it's, it would be, you know, to really put the emphasis in it, it would be, you know, if, if you, you know, maybe, maybe it helps to use the, the language of, of John 20. It says, if you forgive someone their sins, it is because they have already been forgiven. If you do not forgive them, it's because they have not been forgiven. And so, so it's really a, a recognition of, of someone's status before God. So it's not that the leaders of the church are the ones who, who have the power to, to say, you know what, you really have ticked me off today, and so that's it. You're out of heaven. It's not like, you know, leaders in the church have this superpower. If so, that would be scary. But it's, it's the idea that, that, you know, if we are selecting wise men to be elders in the church, these should be men of discernment. And so by the, the work of the Holy Spirit, you know, these kind of leaders should be ones who can recognize if we see repentance in someone or if we don't see repentance in someone. So it's that saying, it's like, if, if, you, if you see forgiveness in someone, it's because you see what I see in them. If you do not see repentance in someone, it's because you, I've, en- I've enabled you to see what I see in them. In this case, it's, it's a lack of repentance. So does that help to kind of explain that, that context a little more? Which, again, for Gary, for like you and I who are elders, that's still kind of a scary idea that we're supposed to have that, that kind of wisdom and discernment from God. But again, that's where we cannot do our jobs if it is not for the, the Holy Spirit. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I give you the Holy Spirit because we can't do that without the Holy Spirit. All right, Kiva, do, do you have your hand up for sharing something? Okay, all right, just making sure. I didn't want you to feel like I was ignoring you there. You can get back to doing what you were doing. Okay, so we're looking at, you know, the, this idea of the, the keys of the kingdom, uh, that, that language of keys. What, why, why do you think that we're using the language of keys? What do keys mean? Cohen? Yeah, yeah, and so let's, let's try to put this into a different context. Let's say you're my neighbor, and I'm going to go away on vacation, and I need someone to, to feed my animals. And so I say, hey, Cohen, while I'm gone, can, can you feed my pets for me? And then because you're such a nice guy, what would you say? Yeah. yeah. So then what would I give you so that you have the ability to feed my pets? Yeah, I'd give you a key. And so while you have that key, does that mean you own my house? No, but you do have a certain authority. I give you the authority, the right to enter my, my house, to, to take care of my, my business while I'm, I'm gone. And so while it's not a perfect illustration, we do see some similarities to the Christ as he goes back up to heaven to be at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. It's like, you know... I need you to feed my sheep. I mean, that's, that is actually what he says to, to Peter in the, in the John 20. It's like, I'm going to be gone, so Peter, you, yeah, I need you to feed my sheep. And so using the, the language of when he's talking to him back in Matthew 16, it's like, I'm going to give you the keys, the keys that you need so you can feed my sheep while I'm gone. And so the keys, it's not a physical set of keys, but saying so I'm giving you an authority. I'm giving you a responsibility that comes with my power. Because again, you know, if, you, if you're borrowing your neighbor's keys, it doesn't mean that it's your house, but you get to enter that person's house 
based on their power, their authority that they're giving to you for that time. And so this is that, that idea, the keys of, of the kingdom, that we as the church have a responsibility to, to bring in those who are repentant, those who, who have true faith, and to preserve them and to protect them, but also to, to protect the, the health of the, the church from those who want to be a part of things for, for bad motives. And, and I'll try to be careful with that because we want to have visitors. And uh, you know, in, in our church, you know, we, we, as, as long as, as someone is being kind and not being disruptive, I, I want people, whether they believe or not believe, to be here in church so that way they have an opportunity to hear the gospel so that maybe they will come to this place of, of true faith. Because sometimes people say, well, I've got a friend who, who's living this lifestyle over there, which is clearly not a Christian lifestyle, but they're curious about our church. Can they come? Yes, let them come. But when we talk about church membership and who is a member of the church, at that point now we're saying that you are a member of God's covenant family, that you are someone who has shown repentance and that you are someone who, who's been made equal in, in the eyes of God. And if we have people that, if we say, hey, our goal is just to try to get the church to be big and make sure the pews are, are filled up. So we'll take anyone and give that stamp of approval to them. Well, fortunately, if we do that, then we may be bringing people into the church whose hearts are actually more for a sense of division. Or maybe they want to call themselves a Christian so they can do that self-righteous game of, look, I go to church every Sunday. And you, like, or you know, we, we see a warning in, in Timothy uh, against those who see godliness as a means to financial gain. And, and so there are a lot of wrong reasons why people might be a part of church. And, and if we just let anyone come and, and be a member of our fellowship without trying to gauge if there is a true and honest repentance in them, then that, that can become very detrimental to, to the health of, of Christ's family. And so there, there is an authority that is given for, for a reason. We want to be welcoming to all people, but we need to be careful not to assume that everyone is, is ready to, to have that, that place in the, in the family of God. So I know that's a, a little bit of a personal disclaimer, not, not pointed to a specific Bible passage, but does that concept make sense? Yeah, because I know it, sometimes we, we get it where, like I said, if you've, if you've got friends who you're like, I mean, they're, they're definitely not living the lifestyle, but can they come to church? Yes. Yes, I want to make very clear, because every once in a while I'll hear a story where, you know, someone will invite a friend and someone else who knows about that neighbor will be like, what are you doing here? You shouldn't be here. This is for Christians. And it breaks my heart because you had that opportunity for those people to hear the gospel. Maybe they were curious and hungry. I mean, why else would they come to, come to church? It's not the cool thing to do anymore. Why would they be here? And, and yet, you know, if, if we're not understanding where we need to be welcoming and where we need to, to be cautious, uh, we, we might miss out on opportunities to make the gospel known in the lives that need it. So, okay, so looking at question 48 and the, the importance of, of preaching... We see the idea of how the kingdom of heaven is opened by preaching, and, and what is that? How, how, is, how does preaching open the kingdom of heaven to people? Even just kind of hinted at that just a, a, a minute ago. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's the preach, preaching of the gospel message. It's, it's where people have that chance to hear that, that call to, to repentance. Uh, it's like, you know, how can, how can somebody believe if they have not been told, and how can they, or, how, or if, how can somebody believe if they do not know, and how can they know if someone hasn't told it to them, and so that's where we have this, this important work of, of, you know, when you invite people to church, and if, if we're doing the preaching of God's word correctly, they should be hearing often, you know, that, the good news of the gospel, and that, that call to, to repentance, uh, but also thinking about with what we see in, in Romans chapter 1, where it talks about that, that, that all of us are, are held accountable that because nature itself teaches us about the nature of God and that, that whether we're told explicitly or not, you know, the, the world around us tells us that, 
that, we're, that this world has been made by someone and we're not doing a good job of taking care of his earth. And so you don't have to come to church to hear the message of condemnation. But unless it's coming to church or the church coming to you, unless it is just by a sheer providential miracle of God, people are not going to, to hear the gospel message. And that's where I'm, I'm hopeful, like with, with us live streaming our services, that there's someone who's just, maybe they're, they're looking up a, a YouTube recipe for, you know, a, for a, a new dessert that they want to make, and the video plays on, and they happen to stumble upon this or many, one of the many other churches that are now putting on. It's possible that, you know, they're able to hear a gospel message out of sheer randomness, but we need to preach the message, the word of God, because if we do not hear it, then we're not going to be able to, to receive it. Um, what well, we also talk about preaching as a, a closing of the kingdom of heaven to people. How do we close the kingdom of heaven with the preaching? Yeah, if, if they don't believe, uh, that, that would be true. And, and hopefully the way that we do preaching is that um, we create a clear standard of, of what repentance looks like. Yeah, it's, it's the, you know, if, if, if we're preaching of the nature of sin and the nature of grace, and uh, kind of like with the, 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 the story of, of Jonah, and we see how that history is like a mirror for us that we can see our, our own corrupted nature and say, you know, this is, this is a challenge that is for each of us. Do you see the sin within yourself? Do you see how, how sin can become destructive and leading to death? And tell people, you have an opportunity and an and offer has been made to you to, to repent. You know, you're, you're creating that, that barrier of saying, you get one of two options. Either you repent and follow Jesus, or you don't. And you don't experience the benefits of of his grace. And this is why it's important that when, when we are sharing the word of God, when we're, when we're preaching to our neighbors or, or the preaching that, that we hear in this church or other churches, it's very important for us to make sure that sin is often a part of our conversation. Because this is where, you know, I love the church of Jesus Christ, but I, I do have a concern of, of a tendency that, that has grown within the United States to try to soften the gospel. Because you know, hey, Jesus loves you and he wants good things to happen for you. We, we like that. That's a, that's a good message. But to say that you are, you, you are totally depraved and even the best things that you try to do with your life, we still turn them into a form of corruption and a mockery of the glory of God. And that on your own, you cannot do a single thing that is truly good or right. That, that's not going to sell very well, at least not on its own, Right? You know, it definitely needs to be paired with the grace of Jesus Christ. But there's a lot of churches that said, you know what, let's, let's just talk about the grace. Let's not talk about the sin side of it. But the end result is, is if you just tell people that you're a good person, and there is grace that is made available to you. It's like, you, we've got good, but you could be extra good. Is that really the message that we need to hear? If, and just think of it like spiritually, like let's, let's say you've got a medical condition that the doctors need to treat, and they, they say, it's like, if we don't treat this medical condition, you're a ticking time bomb. We don't know if it's going to be, if it's going to be 10 years from now, one year from, from now, 10 days from now. Like we, we don't know when it's going to be, but someday this is going to catch up with you, and it's going to become a problem. Uh, and, and you need to face up to the facts that, you, that there's a surgeon that can help you, that can do a thing that you cannot do for yourself. If, if we're not willing to share that message, be like, you know what? You're pretty good health. You're mostly good. You're mostly healthy. Yeah, you got that one thing over there, but that's embarrassing, so we're not going to talk about that. You're mostly good. Well, that's not going to help this person, no. And we see this with, with sin, is that we have a spiritual disease. And there is a day in which it will catch up with us. We don't know if it's going to be 10 years from now. We don't know if it's going to be 10 days from now. But there's a point in which this life is going to be over. 
And if we have not dealt with our sin, then the consequences are going to be eternally disastrous. And so if we love people, we need to let each other know about our sins. We need to acknowledge it. We need to be able to call it out and not call it out in such a way of, oh, I see your sins. Look what you did. No, no, it's, it's like Jesus says, you know, take the plank out of your own eye before you take the speck out of your friend's eye, which means that we should be people who take the plank out of our own eye so that we can help people with the speck in their eye. Like, we want to take it in the, in the sense of, brother, sister, like, I know, I get it. I tell you, like, five years ago, I was really struggling with this same problem. But I had a friend who called me out and said, you know, this is destructive. And because of them calling me out, my, my trusting that God has the power to rescue me and restore me has changed my life. I admitted, yeah, I am struggling with this problem, this addiction over here. And I see that this has become form of spiritual slavery for you and I want you to know that as damaging as this is the grace of God is even stronger and so we need to be able to communicate the, the reality of sin so that people will see the, the necessary need for the grace of God and, and the salvation that he offers to us so that's where you try I, I, you hear me say maybe nine out of ten sermons at some point along the way, the importance to repent and believe. We need both of those messages there. And if you don't say it, if, if there are pastors who don't say it explicitly in those terms, it doesn't mean that they're a bad pastor. It just means that they're probably better at preaching and don't have to say it so blatantly as I do. So, yeah, just, I, I acknowledge. Okay, how about discipline? That's a... Uh, that's a, that's a difficult conversation right there. How, how is, how, how does, the, how is the kingdom of heaven closed? Notice how there, there's a reversal. When you're talking about preaching, we're talking about opening and closing. Now we're talking about closing and opening uh, the, the kingdom of heaven. But how does Christian discipline close the kingdom of heaven? Yeah, the Matthew 18 is a really practical guide. And uh, whether, you're, whether someone's a Christian or not, this is just good advice to keep you from trouble and to help get others out of trouble. But Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 through 20. If your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault, just between the two of you. If he listens to you, you have won, you, won, you have won your brother over. But if he will not listen... Take one or two others along, so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen to even the church, treat him as you would a pagan or tax collector. I tell you the truth. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about agree about anything you ask for it will be done for you by my father in heaven for wherever two or three come together in my name there i am with them which is also useful to know notice the the context when you talk about when two or three gather together in my name i am with them usually we talk about that in worship services or praying that when we pray together well it it, it does include praying but it's also in the greater context of of church discipline and uh yeah, so it's just one of those things when um, I, I like, I, I'm a big fan of context, keeping things in, in context. Uh, it's just knowing that, uh, that, that there is a power. There is a power of the kingdom of heaven of, of when we, we team together to, uh, to help hold each other accountable. And so, you know, this, this is a passage that, that does show, uh, I think, more of the it, it does show a. Uh, it, it does show show both of the the opening and the closing. But you have that that first sense of of the opening of of the gospel of, you know, when, when you 
when your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault, just between the two of you. If he listens to you, you have won over your brother. That's the idea. You, you've helped to, to, to save your, your brother, because if you have a brother who, who is stuck in a, in a sin that is eternally destructive, you don't want them to stay in that. And so sometimes you need the kick in the pants to, to be able to wake up from something that is self-destructive. Ideally, we can do things with kind and, and encouraging words. You know, we want that to be the main motive that, that we have. I think of that like with you know, discipline with, with our dogs. Like, you know, we've been studying a lot of you know, how do you train your dog, and you want the overwhelming you know, language that you use to be positive, but you know, there are certain times where you need to, to use that negative word, no. <laughs> you know, they say, don't do that with dogs. Uh, we tried that for a while, and we could not train the dog until we said no. Yeah, Tom? Yeah, the, the binding and loosing. So that's, that is, is more of a, of a covenantal language of, of saying that the, there are those who, who are bound and, and included into the, in, into the, the covenant of, of God, so that family covenant. And so, so it's, it's a kind of idea of... of um, you know, that you, you're, you, you think of it kind of like weaving, that like you, you are woven, you are an integral part of, of this family. And then you've got the idea of, of loosening, of taking and removing and setting it apart. And so that, that idea, uh, like I was talking about earlier with the forgiving and not forgiving is, is the, the church saying that, you know, either, you know, I, I see that repentance in you and we, we celebrate that, that repentance and yes, feel all, all the joys that, that come as being a member of God's family, or you have that discipline where it's, it's uh, and, and this is where I like with Matthew 18, that it's, it's a process of, of saying, you know, I see something that, that is concerning. We need to work on this. We need to talk about it because I'm scared that if, if we do not address this, that your soul may be at, at stake, and I love you too much to, to see this become an eternal problem for you. And if you work with someone and you see no signs of repentance in them whatsoever, and then you acknowledge, if the fruit of the Holy Spirit was in this person, then, then we would be able to recognize some of those traits. And if we don't see that in them, then, then they can't be bound as, as a part of this, this basket. They cannot be bound as a part of this family. And so we have to painfully you know, make the, the declaration of, if things continue to stand the way that they are, that you are not a, a member of, of God's family, which is a hard thing to do. I've, I've, when, uh, when, when my wife and I were in St. Louis, we were, we were part of a, of, of a church where we had to see this, this process take place. And uh, did we, I'm trying to remember, did we see this process happen twice while we were there or was it just once? Um, it was twice, but one was Yeah. Yeah, okay, that's what I thought. I couldn't remember if they were both at the same church or one was from another church, but, but we, we were there, and, and you had, at least in one case, possibly both cases, because like Kat said, it was, it was one that was kept private because the thing is is that uh, we're, we're not trying to turn this into a gossip thing. Like it could say start just between you and your friend. If you can resolve it just between you and your friend, that's great because you can risk a lot of shame and embarrassment. Uh, but if you can't resolve that, then you don't just go onto like, you know, Twitter or something like that and say, hey, my friend, of no, 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 we don't do that. And so, so it's like you, you find a few others that you trust and respect and bring them in and say, all right, this, this is not just because I'm bitter and I don't like what you said to me, but you don't like what I said. It's not a, a, a he said, she said kind of a situation that here, here comes in, in, in hopefully impartial party who can say, no, no, we, we agree, we see the same troubling, concerning thing in you. And, uh, and then if it doesn't work, then you go and bring it to the church, which we recognize as, as people like Peter or the elders of the church, that they would bring this in. And so in the case of this church, there was, there was one where uh, we don't know a lot of those details because, praise God, it didn't have to go to the point that it was publicly had to, to, to be ex expressed or, or explained to, to, to people. Uh, but we, we do know that there was just a celebration of, of someone was, was held accountable and they, they acknowledged their sins and they, and they repented of it. And I can say, praise God. I mean, that, that, that person, you know, that their, their destiny may, may have been, been defined in that moment uh, because 
you know, when, when, when we're trapped into sin, if we're unwilling to let go of that sin, then that means that we haven't took hold of the Savior. And, and so we don't want people to continue down that path. But then we had, unfortunately, with a, with a case of one of the, the brothers in, in our church, and one who, um, he showed so many signs of spiritual leadership within the church. But unfortunately, he started an, an, an affair. He was sleeping with another woman. And when he was called to account, he was unwilling to, to, to give up that relationship with his, his mistress and would rather leave his wife and kids to, to go into this relationship with another woman. And, and as, as the church tried to, to hold him to account, and he said, nope, I would rather live this life than the life that you're, you're calling me to. And it was a heartbreaking thing. And, and in that moment, our desire was not to say, ha, 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 look, you're a sinful person. No, no. We wanted to see that family held together. We wanted to see that, that brother restored. We wanted to see that repentance in him. That's the goal. But unfortunately, in that case, that's, that's not what we saw. And because he was so unwilling, after many attempts, to say, yes, this is not according to God's plan, that we just had to say, I'm sorry, but you're no longer a member of, of this church. And we are praying that you will repent and come back and, and be able to rejoin the fellowship. Amy, did I see where you about to raise your hand? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so there's there's a couple of sections that are referenced into in chap first Corinthians chapter five. I'll read both. So verses three through five. Even though I am not physically present, I am with you in spirit. I have already passed judgment on the one who did this, just as just as if I were present. When you were assembled in the name of our Lord Jesus and I am with you in spirit, and the power of our Lord Jesus is present. Hand over this man to Satan, so that the sinful nature may be destroyed, and his spirit saved on the day of the Lord. Which a pause right there. I mean, that's, that's kind of a strange say, statement of, hand him over to Satan so that his spirit may be saved. <laughs> like, how? And, 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 and this is one of these things where, you know, I've, I've, I've heard this from, from people who've struggled with addictions, where, they said that people warned them, they told them, don't, don't do this, don't go down this, this path, you'll regret it, but they didn't believe it, and they had to hit rock bottom before they could say, oh, you know what, they were right. And, and sometimes when people hit that rock bottom is when you see that repentance. And so that, that seems to be the, the kind of hope is, hand them over to Satan. Let, let them see what it's like to have Satan as their master. And by the grace of God, they may see Satan is not the good master that we hoped for because if they see the results of not being a part of the covenant family, then maybe they'll say this isn't worth it and turn around and repent. And this is one of these things where, let's just take, for example, a, a year like, like 2020 and, and the kind of isolation that a lot of people have, have felt and, and knowing uh, what a great benefit it is to have the people in the church that you know, we're trying to keep an eye on each other and calling people and, and making sure that people are taken care of. And, and I wonder, like, what, what would it be like for some people if you weren't a part of the church and you're going through some difficulty in, in life? Let, let's say, like, you need to go to the hospital and you can't drive yourself. Who in the world are you going to look to? Who's going to help you? There are benefits of being a part of the covenant family. But if we let someone go and they see the hardships of what it's like to be, a part of, or to be apart from God's family that maybe they'll see. This isn't what I was hoping for, and that they'll turn around and repent. Were you about to? Yes. That. Well, and for 15, it's a good example of that. We lost the prodigal son. Yeah. And we can take it. Yeah, so we'll go there for now, because you bring it up, and that is a great example. So he so Luke chapter 15, verses 20 through 24. So he got up and went to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and he was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to the servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate, for the Son of Mine was dead and is alive again. 
he was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. And that is a great picture of what we want the process of, of discipline to, to look like. Because it's like, you know, when we discipline our, our own kids. We discipline our kids, it's not because we want them to suffer. It's because we want them to learn the consequences of selfishness or whatever it is that we're, we're dealing with so that they would be able to grow from it. And, you know, when, when we see that repentance, you know, or even the, the, the sign of repentance at that moment was so small that it was his son off there on the horizon. That was the, the sign of repentance that was needed. He didn't actually say those words yet. I'm sorry, forgive me. And the father was running and delighted to receive him. Like, they were just... Show me a little repentance. That's all I'm asking for. Show me a sign. Because you see how destructive your sin is. And, and that's what we, we need to be doing as a church when we hold each other accountable. Because I do know that, like, there, unfortunately, the church discipline has become one of these things that I think that we have neglected as, as the American church. Uh, I, I think we've, we've neglected it, and, and it's within our denomination, but not just our denomination. I, I believe it's, you know, in, in, in every congregation, <laughs> well, I guess almost every congregation, that one we were part of in St. Louis is, was doing an active job of that, but congregations I've been part of, congregations I've seen in other denominations, we don't do this because it's hard. It, it's painful. But the thing is, is that from what I've seen from God's Word and from the example of churches that have done this well, is that it is an act of love when we discipline one another. One of, the, one of our, our neighborhood churches in Indiana, they, they were a church that was going through a discipline process, and they never told me specifically why, but they said that you know, it was such a hard process um, for, to, to discipline one of the, the gentlemen from their, their church, and they had to get to the place where they, they said, I'm sorry, we do not see repentance in you, and so we cannot recognize you as a full member of, of this church. And that person stopped attending. It's not that they said, we'll, we'll never want to look at you and speak to, to you again. But the, the end results of that, even though it was hard to say goodbye to that individual, the rest of the church, they said afterwards, there, there, was, there, there, was, a, there was a sign of life and, and a joy that had, had returned to the church because of that promise, because they, they recognized there is something real about this. It's not, church is not a social club. It's not something that we do because, you know, well, I've got time in this schedule and, you know, we have a similar hobby. It's, it's, not, it's not quite like that. What we're talking about is real. And that there is a real hope and a real salvation that is offered to us. And that recognition that, you know, brother, sister, I see repentance in you. And I see that you and I are going to be sharing the, this eternal glory together. But then to, when we recognize it, no, I'm sorry. I, I, we don't see that. And, and we're concerned about that. Trying to hold, call someone to account, it is, it's love. Because let's, let's just say you, you had a family member uh, who, you know, let's, let's, say, let's say, you know, you, you got kids in the house. They grow up. One of them, you know, they're, they're over 18, and so they have the right to move off, go on on their own. They can be their own person. And just one day that your child just, didn't show up at the house. I'm like, eh, well, that's weird. But you didn't try calling their cell phone. You didn't try calling the police. You didn't try finding out what was, was happening. They just, ah, oh, that's strange. Well, I guess you know, that's going to save us some money on, on food bills, right? <laughs> Would that be love? No. And th think of the way that, that we, ha we have a tendency to do church where being a member of the church is is a status that doesn't have much meaning to it. Hey, you want to come and, and sit in these pews for a while and keep them warm? Great, we'll call you a member. Oh, you stop showing up? Okay, that's fine. You know, I'm not even going to call you. It's okay, that's... Is that love? No. But we're scared to call someone because we say, you know, I, I haven't seen you for a while. I'm concerned. How, how have you been? And that feels judgmental. It feels mean, but is it really? <laughs> to just say, you know what? You are too important to me. You are too valuable for me for that, to just let you drift off and disappear. No, I'm not going to let that happen. Or 
and this, again, let's take this back into the context. Let's say this is someone who continues to come to church every Sunday, but you see a pattern in their life where you're like, I'm really worried that if you continue down this road that this is going to have eternal consequences that are not good for you. It doesn't feel good at the time to say it. But when we do, it's an act of love. I care about you too much to let you continue down this path. And so, you know, there are ways that we can do this well, and if we do it as, as Scripture commands us to, that it is an, an act of love. But um, I also want to admit that in, in the last town that we, we lived in, that there was a church that I was not a big fan of the way that they, they were doing church discipline because they took that route of if you saw a sin in somebody's life, it was brought to the council immediately, and then they voted. Are you going to be a member in the church of good standing or not? And they were very quick to say that this person cannot be a member of good standing, and that what that means is that even if this is your own parents, you cannot talk to them. You cannot visit them during the holidays. You cannot visit them when they're in the hospital. If you see them in the store, you cannot even look and smile at them. You have to turn the other way and find another aisle. And I appreciate the desire to take discipline seriously. But is that discipline with the desire for reconciliation? I mean, maybe I'm not reading it right. Maybe just from my perspective, because I'm not a, a part of a church that does that, takes it seriously enough, like, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe they got it right and I don't, but to me that seems very dangerous and completely missing the point. This is where we, we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5, again, now looking at verses 11 through 13. But now I am writing to you that you must not associate with anyone who calls himself a brother but is sexually immoral or greedy, an idolater or slanderer, a drunkard or a swindler. With such a man, do not even eat. Which right there, look, okay, like I, I, I kind of see where this church is coming from because do, do not eat with them and do not associate with them. Yeah. But and yet those are the people that Jesus hated. Yeah, Jesus... <laughs> Yes, yeah, that is, a, that is a great context. Jesus did eat with these people, and people were not happy. Uh, but then he says, what, what business is, a, is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are, are you not to judge those inside? Will God judge those outside? Expel the wicked man from among you. And so, like, we, we do see a bit of that foundation of, okay, like, there is a certain type of of distancing that, that we need to do. And hopefully it's not the one that says, if I see you in the store, even if you're, you're my own father and mother, I'm going to go find another aisle. I, I don't think that's quite the same extent. And, and like you, you pointed out very well, that that is not the way that Jesus Christ himself treated it. But Yes. It says that by withholding the sacraments. And yes, and and that's that is is where I, I see that you know that that is rightly applied. And like we were saying before, it's like if you have someone who is not a Christian, can they come to church? Yes, please let them come to church. But to have a member of good standing means that we're going to to allow them. Correct, and that's that's that concern is that if if we if we see something that that we we see that does not line up with with the the, the way of righteousness that God has laid out for us, and we don't see the, the 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 signs of repentance that we want to see, then then we have to take that that assumption that if they do eat and drink, that they're going to be eating and drinking judgment upon themselves, and we don't want that to happen. So that's where we say, okay, well, let's let's slow down here. We're not going to jump to say, okay, like. You're not allowed to talk to us anymore. You're out of here. But it's like, okay, let's slow down here. And I want you to know that, that what's, what I see is, is it, it concerns me. And I care about you too much to eat and drink judgment upon yourself. It's confusing. I think a lot of people want to call it excommunication. Yes. You get the impression that you're not to talk to the person. Yes, yes. Yeah. 
and that's where language over time has, you know, gets different meanings because communication like, is really more of the, the talking about communion. So not like communication as in like calling each other on, on the phone. And so again, you're, you're rightly point, pointing it out. When we excommunicate someone, it's, it's a way of, of saying like at this time, until, until we see certain actions of, of repentance, we're, we're going we're gonna to be withholding this, this table from you. But the end result is what? And this is where we see in, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. If anyone does not obey our instruction in this letter, take special note of him. Do not associate with him in order that he may feel ashamed. Yet, do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. And so, then, like, we've got this, like, both like, all right, there's an arm's lengthening that, that is there, but it's also as, as a brother. Like, my desire is to see your redemption. This is a way to try to be able to protect you. And, and we're talking about that, that association. We're, we're talking about, the, you know, the, this, this acknowledgement of, of the authority of, of Jesus Christ and the declaration of, of our repentance and submission to him. That, you know, if, if someone, if we don't see that in, in them, it's like, well, okay, like, we're, we're, we're going to protect you from this table until you know, we, we see what, what we're hoping for as, as repentance. And, and, and one of the things that's, that's very hard with this is that if, if you are going to discipline somebody, you know, it's going to be so easy for them to look at us and go, oh, yeah, well, I know that you X, Y, Z. And, like, if, if we do this, we need to do this as people who recognize that we are not perfect ourselves. If we're going to be calling out our friends, that they are going to be able to point out sin in our lives. And so this is where, again, the importance is not saying we've got a group of sinners and a group of non-sinners, and only, only the non-sinners can be a part of church, and if you sin, then you can't be a part of church. No, 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 no. That is not what this discussion is about. The discussion is about repentant hearts and unrepentant hearts. Because, yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, I, I'm sure it's not going to take you very long to see the sin that is within me. But if, if I am someone who's filled with the fruit of the Holy Spirit and you call me to account, then hopefully the end result of that is me saying, you know what? You're right. I don't like to admit it, but you're, you're right in that desire to turn around. And so that's, that's what we're looking for, that, that sign of, of repentance. Cohen? Yes. Yes. Yeah, that was a very clever thing to, to go look to that in, in our Grace Altar hymnals, because we do have a procedure for that. And... Uh, that's the thing. Is I, I hope for us to be a church that grows in discipline, but I also hope for us to be a church that never has to use that, that part of our, our grace altar hymnals. Because um, again, our goal is, is not to inflict harm, but to, to rescue someone. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, I was, I was just about to end with that. Well, I, I'm sorry, I interrupted you. So, so say that last part again. Yes. Yep, yeah, and it comes back to, to forgiveness. And, and uh, for the sake of time, we'll end the conversation with, um, with this. But remember, this is Paul writing to the Corinthians. In the first letter he said, you know, how it breaks his heart to, to have to dismiss someone. And now here we have another letter from Paul to the same group of people, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6 through 11. The punishment inflicted on him by the, by the majority is sufficient for him. Now instead, you ought to forgive and comfort him so that he will not be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. I urge you, therefore, to reaffirm your love for him. The reason I wrote you was to see if you would stand the test, to be obedient in everything. If you forgive anyone, I have forgiven him. And what I have forgiven, if there was anything to forgive, I have forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake, in order that Satan might not outwit us for we are not unaware of his schemes. And so just that, that idea, like it seems like we're talking about the same person that he said, you know, you're, you're going to have to 
to disassociate them from the table of, of the Lord. You know, love, love them as a brother, but you do not, they, we cannot associate them with a, with a table. And, and what is the end result? Well, the person seems to have been overwhelmed with excessive sorrow, which, based on the fact that he's saying it's time to show forgiveness, means that that sorrow came from a heart of repentance of, you're right, you're right, I, I have sinned. You know, I, I am heading down a path of, of destruction. And so I'm saying, it's like, all right. They, he acknowledges it. He sees it. Show him grace. Quick, show him the grace of Jesus Christ that he would be restored, that he would be lifted up. And then just that acknowledgement at the end to, um, in order that Satan might not outwit us, for we are not unaware of his schemes. So it's pointed out that there is a scheme, there is a way that Satan is trying to sow divisions within the church to lead people away from the hope of salvation. And based on the context that we're talking about with church discipline, I'm saying it was, it was a test to see if, if the church would do the work of discipline. Does that then mean that one of these schemes of Satan to lead people down a path of destruction is to convince us that we don't need to discipline each other? Is that the scheme to tell, to tell us, oh, that would be so mean. Don't be mean. No, that, that's, don't, you don't want to do that. Oh, the church would never grow if you keep kicking people out. Like, is, is that one of the schemes of Satan? As I said, like we as the American church, we don't do a great job of this, unfortunately. It would be great if we, don't ha- if we didn't have a reason to hold each other accountable, but you know, is this scheme of Satan, is, is that at work in the American church? I, I, would, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't want to go so far in the extreme of that one church that is just, just begging for a reason to kick someone out, even if it's their own family member. We don't want that, but, but I think there is room for us to grow more in that direction because it is a path and a tool of love that Christ has given to the church. So, a lot for us to think about. Did you want to add something? Yeah, so, yeah, so, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, it's, it's saying, because, well, well, because, yeah, because it says, I, you know, that, yeah, that's, that's what it was, not division, but, but sword, yeah, so, I didn't come to bring peace, but, but a sword. Yes, and, and that is, that is the kind of division that, that we're talking about with, with the, like, the keys of the kingdom, the opening and the closing of, of the doors of the kingdom of, when, when the gospel is preached correctly, that we are creating a dividing line, that either you belong to the family or you don't. But we also see that, you know, there is that joy, that, that desire that all might come to repentance. There is, a, there is a desire within us that when that sword comes down, that we are on the, on, the, on the side of Christ, and we want to do what we can to bring people that way. And sometimes that, that act of love is, you know, from, from holding that sword and saying, this is the word of God. And he says, there is a division. And I want to show you the, the consequence. I want to show you the earthly consequences of to being divided from the family of God so that way you may not be cut off in an eternal sense. And so when we want to try to create a, a version of Jesus that's all about, you know, the, the warm, fluffy shepherd, he, all, he only says nice and kind things, you know, did, have you read the words of Jesus? He at times is very harsh. But then also you look at who, who are the ones that he's harsh to? He's harsh to the Jews. He's harsh to the ones that believe that they are righteous, but did not show the kind of repentance that they needed. Because like you were pointing out, Gary, that Jesus, he did eat with tax collectors. He did eat with prostitutes. He did eat with those who were, you know, who were ostracized. He ate with... He, he ate with all kinds of, of, of people, and he showed grace and compassion to, to them. But to, to those who should have known better, he, he spoke to them very harsh. And so, if, if that's the way that, that Jesus treated the church, uh, then, and then I, well, I suppose we should follow his example, should we not? So again, hopefully, as, as we continue to, to, to try to do this well, that the overwhelming feeling that people re- will receive whether which side of, of the, the discipline act that we're talking about is one of love. We want people to feel love for those that, that we're concerned about their choices. And we want those that we speak out to who say, okay, let's slow down here. And let's talk about the choices we're making. 
Let's, let's pray and hope that those who are in that place would feel the, the love from the people as well. So, okay, it's, it's a big topic. If you, if you have more questions on this, uh, you, you can talk to me afterwards or, or some, some other time this week, but um, for, for the sake of, of your schedules, uh, let's, let's turn to, to a moment of prayer. God, we, we acknowledge that you have called us to be your church and that you have given us your mission and your authority here on earth. And that is frightening. We don't necessarily want to do that work. It is not an easy job, and it is a difficult one to do well. And so we confess that if it will be done well, and it must be done by your Holy Spirit, that if we are the ones who call to others to account to have the right heart and the right words, that can only come from you. And to those of us who are in, we're in those moments that we are being held to account, that is only by the Holy Spirit can we have that kind of repentance. So bless us, fill us, Lord, so that those who are lost will be redeemed and be restored, and that your church would be strong and joyful. Father, make us such a church, not just this congregation, but your church across this nation and across this world. We pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen. And so, as we think of the ways to help hold each other up, one of the more positive ways we do that is by praying for each other. Are there uh, ways we can be praying for one another? I guess, uh, Marty, have, have you heard any more updates since we talked a couple days ago? Yeah, I, I, I talked to Clarence, and he said uh, he talked to her on the phone. I guess they, somebody held the phone on a Zoom thing or something. Okay. So, uh, so she knew who she was talking with. That, that helps, yeah. So she's you know, well enough to do that. Okay. Okay. Clarence thinks that maybe first part of the week they're going to maybe move her back to the house. And okay. And they're kind of watching how this COVID is coming along. Yeah, so it sounds like her, her, her oxygen blood levels are still stubborn, yeah. but she's relatively stable. Yeah. So we, we don't, we're not seeing signs of, yeah. of anything worse on the horizon. And keep praying because, you know, things could always change, yeah. but... There's that, that hopefulness that uh, if she's stayed steady this long, that, that okay, and that she may be, may be returning home, you said, later this week? No, no. Or, Clarence was thinking maybe by Tuesday or something, but since the first part of this week. Oh, okay, so maybe, yeah. maybe the first part of this week. How it all turns out better. Yeah, maybe home, Okay. Sienna, did you have someone you wanted us to be praying for? All right, pray for Hunter Rose and others who, who have dealt with or continuing to, to deal with cancer. Yep, yep, Deb V. So, yeah, the uh, last talking with them is just that. They're, they're continuing to do the treatments because the treatments are going so well and because they can keep pushing her. They, they want to see um, as much of that, 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 that tumor to be shrunk as, as possible. And so on one hand, the fact that they say, um, so on, on one hand, it's nice because, hey, you know, she seems to be enduring it relatively well, but the flip side of saying, because it's going so well, we're going to keep doing this to you is, uh, must be frustrating. Be, be praying for, for her. Are there others that we can be lifting up? Cohen? Yeah, so the raising of money for the wheelchairs for Nigeria. Did you say that the school almost has enough for 10 chairs now? Is that? So the goal was two. We've almost reached 10. So that's awesome. That is awesome. 
Yep, that is a good problem to have. So. Okay, so thinking of ways to put things into action with, with your mother at this point, it's, it's just praying for her, pray. Pray, which is not a small thing. And then uh, think, thinking of, of Deb, uh, would someone like to reach out to, to her this week to, to give her a little encouragement? All right, Kat, thank you for, for doing that. And then, uh, yeah, just pray for the, the Christian school. They're, they're uh, trying to raise money for wheelchairs for those who've suffered from polio in, in Nigeria. And uh, if, uh, if, you, if, you, if you want to contribute to, to that and you haven't done so, you can talk to, to Cohen, but also recognize that you know, they're, they're well above the, you know, that, that cause right there. So, um, yeah, so it's just it's on you. What, what you want to do with that information. But let's, let's pray to the Lord. Father, we, we thank you for your great providence and the fact that, that nothing escapes your notice. You are with us in all things and at all times, through the joys and through the struggles. And, and we are grateful for your unchanging nature and care when we think of those like Agnes as, as she is still in the hospital because of her oxygen levels due to, to COVID, and we praise you that, that we have not seen any of the, the frightening dips of, in health that, that some people have gone through because of COVID, but we do recognize that there is still a, a real consequence of this, this disease on her, and, and we pray that you would relieve that from her, and that if it is possible for, for her to, to return home in a safe manner, that, that she would be able to, to do so. We pray those who are struggling with cancer or those who have recovered from cancer, and we give you praise that Hunter Rose, as far as we know, still is cancer-free. Uh, but we do pray for Deb VB as, as she is going through her, her chemotherapy, and, and we pray that, that, that she is continuing to endure that well and that it is effectively shrinking the tumor so that when they do come to t time for the surgery that it would be that it would be simple, and it would be, um, that, it would be, that it would be successful. And Lord, we thank you for the, the compassion of, of those who are making wheelchairs accessible to polio victims in Nigeria. And, and if there are ways that your kingdom can be seen and known better through this, this activity, let it be so. But, but any time we, we see the lame being able to walk in one sense or another, that is a, a small sign of your kingdom. And maybe this isn't the type of recovery and healing that you yourself are able to give in the future and the kind that you had given to people in the past when you walked on this earth, but still, it reminds us of your grace and mercy and help us to be people who anticipate and pray for your resurrecting power, whether it be the full power that we see in the next life or just the little hints and the promises of this resurrection to come in the here and now. God, show your love to us. And Father, we also just pray for the, this, again, the, this work of discipline. Well, let us be people who do it effectively, uh, that, that, your, that your family would, would be healthy, that the, the individuals may grow, and that it would be a source of joy and delight for all of us. Father, we, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And now I invite you to stand with us in body or in spirit as we recite the unifying words of the Apostles' Creed. Let us say now together, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, 
the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above you, heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Brothers and sisters, as we go, we go with this blessing from Ephesians 3. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Let's go now together in peace.